Hello and welcome to Wrestling at Random. I'm Jeremy Deemer. And I am Adam Summers. You are here in season five of the podcast where the theme is more wrestling than ever. We've dumped even more wrestling content into the randomizer, as Jeremy has said over and over again. 19,000 entries of professional wrestling shows in the randomizer. That's somewhere around 60,000 hours of pro wrestling available to be chosen. Not only are there more and different uh, and just more outlandish things in the randomizer, uh, considering where we're at now, that means newer and newer shows are available or eligible for the only guideline, which is it has to be 10 years or older. That means this show that we're reviewing you here, it would not have been available in the early seasons of this show, but it is eligible now. Extreme Rules 2012 from WWE. This is a WWE pay-per-view event from April 29th, 2012. We fired up the randomizer like we do every single week. It could pick any of these shows. And it picked a WWE pay-per-view from 2012. And this one took place at the Allstate Arena in Chicago, Illinois. I was not there, but I, I did watch this show on pay-per-view. That that was in my notes when I saw it was at that absolute dump, the Allstate Arena slash Rose Monterized. And I thought, well, Jeremy there, I know we reviewed that uh is it from 2011, the show with Punk uh, taking the title? It was. It was uh, Money in the Bank, Punk John Cena. We reviewed that in our bonus feed. We actually have uh, bonus content over at our Patreon, patreon.com slash wrestling at random. Over there, we do bonus episodes that you can't get for free here in the free feed. Um, if you're an Apple Podcast subscriber, you can. Uh, it's in your podcast feed you can just hit uh, subscribe it'll unlock all of the 140 150 plus episodes we have in the bonus feed um, otherwise you can go to patreon.com slash wrestling at random and sign up or you can go to spotify as well uh, in your spotify there's a button you can click that can also subscribe to all of that bonus content and yeah we were i was at that show the punk and john cena show i was not at this show and this is another monumental show because it features the return of Brock Lesnar. We'll get into that in some more detail as we get towards the main event. Uh, but reading the Wrestling Observer newsletter from Dave Meltzer, he had, uh, in talking about the return of Lesnar and the promotion of Brock Lesnar around this, uh, he had a quote from Terry Funk. Terry Funk would always bring up that pro wrestling needs a Johnny Valentine. Valentine's philosophy was, I can't make them think wrestling is real, but I sure can make them think I'm real. And Terry Funk got his wish a few weeks back when the WWE signed Brock Lesnar for his big return here. Uh, Lesnar had a run as a top guy in pro wrestling. He was the youngest world champion in WWE history at the time. But he gained far more stardom when he left and became a UFC heavyweight champion. He became such a big star that he could command more than five times the money for less than one-tenth of the dates to work that he was able to negotiate last time he was a WWE contracted performer. The promotion of the return of Brock Lesnar was perfect. He was portrayed as something very different from any other wrestler in WWE or any other wrestler coming along. And we open with the video package recapping uh, Brock Lesnar's return. We see a video of him beating up John Cena. We see John Cena trying to cut a serious promo about this situation. Brock in full Brock mode all the arrogance and charisma oozing out as he says, uh, if I was still around for the last eight years, he'd be carrying my bags. He's a scared man. And when Brock Lesnar says it, it's serious stuff. And Cena is, at this point in time, he's coming off of a loss to The Rock at WrestleMania 28. And he has Brock Lesnar to deal with now. This video package was awesome. Well, it was great. It's... It, it, it... It lead into what you were saying about the presentation of Brock Lesnar as being something completely different from every other superstar uh, in the sports entertainment world that was the WWE. The best way to describe this is this is a UFC countdown show interview rather than a wrestling promo. It's 
completely different from the way WWE would hype their matches, their shows. And for that reason, it works. It's tremendous. The show drew a legitimate sellout. 14,817 fans to the dump that is the Allstate Arena, as you mentioned. Uh, the show had 11,500 paid with a gate of more than $700,000. That's a pretty uh, surprising number of comps for a, sh- uh, a pay-per-view in Chicago. They can do that when the 11500 paid is a house of seven hundred k. <laughs> Those are some high-ticket prices. True. But, uh Justin Roberts is the ring announcer. Uh, as soon as I heard his voice, I'm like, oh, my one of my least favorite announcers. Michael Cole, Jerry the King Lawler, and Booker T are the announced team. <laughs> For a three-hour broadcast of professional wrestling, here we go. And from there, the fun, quote-unquote, continues as we start with a video package about Kane. Which, if you've been following our bonus feed during the break that took place for many months between Season 4 and Season 5, what unfolded was an uncomfortable reality that we had become the Kane and Paul Bearer podcast. And I cackled. I almost fell off my couch because this video package reminded me of that bizarre episode of SmackDown that somebody requested (laughs) us to watch. In the bonus feed, which was all about Edge kidnapping Paul Bear, who was Kane's father. This was like a six-segment long uh, story that went throughout that show. There, the entire story was that Kane was so upset that his father, Paul Bear, had been kidnapped that he would do anything. He would hurt anyone to get his dad back. Here... Not that many years later, this story is that uh, Ran- or Kane apparently tried to kill Cowboy Bob Orton. Uh, as revenge, Randy Orton ties up Paul Bear and has him wrapped up on a chair just like that Edge SmackDown show. But here Kane says, I don't care what happens to my father, Paul Bear. So something very uh, significant has changed in the mind of Kane. I feel like we've missed something in the lore of Kane and Paul Bear that needs to be filled in here because this is not the same man I remember. No, something happened. That SmackDown show, we reviewed episode 129 in the bonus feed. Uh, <laughs> November 19th of 2010. So just a year and a half later, uh, he doesn't care about his father anymore. And I just watched a two-hour episode where he was... Uh, very concerned about his kidnapped father, but I howled with laughter. This was so funny when, uh, yeah, Orton paid him back by kidnapping Paul Bear. I'm like, oh my god, this is so funny for this podcast. This is a very our podcast funny moment. It is. Uh, I love the the way the randomizer slash the intentionalizers over on our bonus feed. Uh, the way these unintended threads will sometimes be connected uh, and pulled, that definitely happened here. And we learned that, yes, it will be in the opening match of this show, a Falls Count Anywhere match between Kane and Randy Orton. Kane comes out with some helmet-type mask on that he removes to have a regular mask underneath it that he wrestles in. Kane looked more like Black Blood then Kane here, if you are a listener to our bonus feed, you'll get the reference No, Black there. Blood is here in the... Uh, this oh, is, that's that was, uh, right! That's, that's here in our... Uh, uh, just a week ago or so. very, if you're listening in linear fashion, my God, that's right. Uh, how WCW do we, Chicago. I think I'm just trying to not somehow introduce <laughs> the lore of Black Blood into all the different stories we have to follow here with Kane. Um, but yeah, this is a weird look for Kane uh, by Kane standards. Uh, and then Randy Orton comes out, and you, you'll be shocked to know he's walking very slowly to the ring as he hears voices in his head. The thing I note from this once we get into the ring is it is uncomfortably foggy here. I feel like it's uh, like Mortis is about to come out. Falls count anywhere. They fight it in the crowd. They fight to the backstage area. Zack Ryder gets involved. And then Randy throws him into random poles that are just sitting there to be knocked over to make noise. I 
thought this was hilarious. It's a, it, that's a hallmark of WWE backstage <laughs> brawls. I go back to the the best use of random pulls in a brawl backstage would have been the Kane Undertaker, or excuse me, the uh, the Undertaker Mankind, Mankind Boiler Room match, yep. which we reviewed in a, in a previous season of this show. Uh, I'm too distracted, though, because I noticed that Party Boy, Scott Armstrong, one third of the Party Boys is here refereeing this battle. <laughs> Finish, uh, they fight back to the ring, and the finish comes when Randy hits an RKO on a chair in the ring. Randy Orton is your winner. Falls count anywhere matches that end in the ring is always a weird choice. Especially when they spend the entire match hammering home the idea that the fall can happen on the outside because every single time any move happens on the floor, they go for the cover. Uh, this is one of those matches where it was like the... the the ring work, the action was fine. It wasn't good. It wasn't bad. But this crowd and how red hot they were for everything that happened. Chicago in this match crowd was amazing. Made tonight. this feel so much better than it would have. In so many other cities, uh, this would have just been a match and it would have dragged. But the crowd it was like 17 minutes long. So it was it was long. And it's 17 minutes of two guys who are very deliberate in their pacing. Always, but the crowd really carried this. It was fine. It wasn't your traditional opener, uh, but it worked. I, I don't know that I need to find out or need to watch the show where Kane apparently injures Zack Ryder badly enough that Zack Ryder has to be put into a wheelchair for some period of time, and Zack Ryder tried to get his revenge, as you mentioned backstage. That felt a little odd, but I'm sure, I'm sure at some point, some season down the line, that episode of Raw SmackDown will find its way to this show. Johnny Ace is backstage. John Laurinaitis is oh, here. He's God. backstage with Eve Torres. That's who that was? I didn't even know that was like an actual person of any note. I, I was trying and could not place who the, who the woman was with him. Teddy Long comes in with champagne. Teddy's no longer the GM of SmackDown. He works for her now. They toast to change. And, of course, John Laurinaitis' slogan, people power. And then that he gets a, a call from Triple H and walks off. People power, John Lauren Nice. This is not an era of WWE that I was watching at all, which is kind of amazing. We'll get to it with some of the guys that were, were featured wrestlers, but just was not my thing. Uh, it's also, we get the, after that, we get the always funny thing where they say, We're in Chicago, and they show the skyline. And it's like, No, actually, you're in Rosemont just off the highway. I guess that would not have made for as good of a visual. Then here comes. The only Funkasaurus in captivity, future NWA world champion, <laughs> the future Tyrus, Brodus Clay with Naomi and some other woman who I don't know. Who Cameron. She is. Her name is Cameron. Mm -hmm. And Horn Swaggle. And this is where we hear Michael Cole, the play by play guy, the lead voice on this show, call Horn Swaggle a smelly troll. And this is where I realize, oh God. Oh, God. No, this is going to be three hours of heel play-by-play -play guy, Michael Cole. Please, God, no. He's not quite heel Michael Cole because this oh, is coming yes. off of the end. It, But it is a uh, – he's supposed to be edgy Michael Cole now at this point. So was, he, he was heel, and now he's just supposed to be edgy Michael Cole. Well, I don't really know the difference because he's hearing through all the heels and saying that all the faces are liars, and it's it, it is incredibly counterproductive as it always was when they had him in whatever version of that role you want to say. It's just as as frustrating. Brodus Clay dancing with the ladies here, and I'm pretty sure this is the old Ernest the Cat Miller theme song. <laughs> it very well may be. Uh, we hear what is definitely. Throughout this match, a Vince McMahon fed line to Booker T where over and over Booker T says, Brodus Clay just likes to have fun. His opponent is Dolph Ziggler, who's accompanied by Jack Swagger. And I have no recollection of this group uh, with, with Vicky Guerrero as their manager. I have no recollection of this. It's also this... funny that Jack Swagger, for the majority of his career, he's like this... this Legit athlete, this decorated college wrestler, and the majority of his career is just being on the floor, being a heater for someone else. It felt like a raw match. Brodus wins when Dolph leaps into Brodus, and Brodus hits him with like a headbutt to the gut, and then hits a babyface splash for the pin. This was Brodus's first pay-per-view victory. 
I thought Dolph Ziggler looked great here. It sucked that he got basically squashed by Brodus Clay, who's a complete zero. Um, uh, this, yeah, the, the, I mean, the most noteworthy thing about this is that Brodus Clay is a baby face and the crowd is completely rejecting him. And we've got loud, let's go Ziggler chants throughout uh, the match. Also, it's noteworthy that Booker T keeps saying shucky ducky quack quack. Yeah, and that uh, Naomi's one of the best workers in this match, and uh, she's just a dancer at this point in her career. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> it's weird to see her as just really a background uh, a piece of this match, and she would go on to be a, a star and a, a very good wrestler in her own right. In the back, we get a wheel spin for the next stipulation. It's a tables match. Tables match for the Intercontinental Championship. The champion is the big show defending against the challenger, Cody Rhodes. I always like, like, we talk about, like, guys that have had different character changes. There is nobody. You talk about heel turns, face turns, that's one thing. But there's no one who went through more, uh, like, subtle and sometimes more traumatic changes in look that never worked than Big Show. This is uh, this is the era of where he's wearing the camo singlet and green uh, toque, the green winter hat. There's a funny moment where he goes like full Bret Hart and tries to uh, put the toque on a kid's head, but it's like three sizes bigger than the kid's head. Uh, we're told that after more than a decade of frustration and failure, Big Show finally achieved his WrestleMania moment this year by beating Cody Rhodes for the Intercontinental title. Really? At WrestleMania 28, he... Captured the Intercontinental title from Cody Rhodes. And he's like crying as he wins it. And this is during the era where the Intercontinental title had never meant less than it would be right here. I just could not buy into that being a, a moment for Big Show at all. All right. Get this finish in this table match. Oh, Cody's in the ring. Big Show is standing on the apron. He's about to. He's, so he, he's, he slid a table into the ring. That's why he was outside. He gets up on the apron and he Cody kicks him. And so Big Show, one foot slips off the apron, and it goes accidentally through a table at ringside. And they ring the bell. New Intercontinental Champion Cody Rhodes. Uh, so Cody, I guess the drop kick counted as putting him through a table? It, it sure seemed like the Big Show put himself through the table. I didn't know that that was a... Because I've seen guys miss moves and go through a table, and that is not yes. the end of the match. No, it's very clearly those are spots they do... To be like, oh, what's the end? No, it's not. This was the most WWE finish to a match on an Extreme Rules pay-per-view you will ever see. It was really just, it was a, a vehicle, a device for show to then come in and kill Cody. There's a way to get the Intercontinental title off him without actually beating him. He choke slams Cody through a table in the ring and then in a terrifying spot, press slams Cody Rhodes over the top rope through a table on the floor. Uh, and then that is that's almost immediately undermined by like 30 seconds later, Cody's up and he's limping to the back, but he's getting up like, man, I don't know. I, I, I would have liked to have seen him at least on camera on the show. We should not have seen that man getting up in the back. They have Daniel Bryan try to do a heel promo to turn the crowd. Now they are because they, they think that, you know, remember Sheamus is the big star in this <laughs> Daniel Bryan Sheamus feud. They show the clip from the match of WrestleMania 28 where Daniel Bryan is world champion, making his WrestleMania debut. Everyone is so excited to see a Daniel Bryan match. Bryan Danielson's going to wrestle at WrestleMania. This is going to be awesome in a championship match. And Sheamus beats him in 18 seconds with one kick. And the people rejected this so hard. And it only fueled the lore of... Brian Danielson, Daniel Bryan, and made him a bigger, beloved babyface. And so he comes and tries to do a, sh a, a heel promo on Chicago to turn the crowd. But this, the, the crowd plays along because Chicago is a great city. But like, uh, as soon as the match starts, there's they're here for one man. <laughs> yeah, and this is where I remember why I was not uh, watching WWE, even though guys like Brian Danielson and CM Punk were. were uh, featured heavily it was because of what they did with brian danielson here um not only is he trying to cut a heel promo and the crowd isn't buying it this is also the textbook example of why you don't need to give everyone the same stilted scripted promos because brian danielson is a great promo in his own way 
but here he's just doing the WWE read a script promo and it comes off so bad it does not feel like him at all um so yeah we'll uh, we'll see where it goes world heavyweight championship two out of three falls match where the ring announcer explains a two out of three falls match uh you in, have to win two falls in painstaking detail <laughs> this is so embarrassing again you talk about wwe moments they have such little confidence that their their fans who are sensibly wrestling fans sports entertainment fans can figure out what a two out of three falls match means without spoon feeding it like it's explaining the rules of war games not only do we have justin roberts I'm surprised i didn't get a graphic yeah, yeah the rules are simple <laughs> then we have uh michael cole explaining it again like 30 seconds after justin roberts does as if this is a difficult concept uh, you so you literally announce one fall in every single match yeah so like if if you're so concerned that people don't understand best two out of three, like never announce one fall. Like just yeah. <laughs> only spend your time trying to explain two out of three falls matches. The the only thing that was more confusing to me than that was Seamus's music. It starts like I in my head I imagine Seamus with some like Irish sounding thing and then some like loud music. Instead, we just hear the words it's a shameful thing and then some like weak alternative rock starts what the hell was this music this sounded like like a like a b-side to the nxt theme song from 2010 yes. they're wild and young here yeah the first time i heard it, i was like did they was he saying too many limes did he have too many limes <laughs> it's uh yeah, so it, it's available on YouTube. I've, I've put it. I have. We have reviewed Seamus things. We've made fun of his song before, and I have spliced it into the podcast before. So uh, I have. I guess I have. I, I blocked <laughs> that from my memory so much that this this uh, offended me anew in how terrible and ill fitting it was for uh, uh, for Seamus. First fall. Premiere Kaeda. If you uh, listen to our CMLL reviews, uh, first fall is Seamus, he tries to kick early, but Brian avoids it this time. He passes and the 18 seconds, so he's already uh, had a better performance than he did at WrestleMania. They grapple, and anytime Seamus has an advantage, the crowd is booing loudly. <laughs> Loud Daniel Bryan chants. It's also noteworthy that uh, Brian Danielson here, uh, Daniel Bryan is so much more tan than Seamus, and that's not something you can normally say about Brian Danielson. Brian with a sunset flip into the ring. Sheamus rolls through, puts on a clover leaf. We get a rope break. Brian does a flip off the top, hits a running clothesline. Sheamus gets knocked to the floor, and Brian off the apron leaps and gets caught. Sheamus takes him, rams him into the barricade. A, a few notes here. Uh, Michael Cole, um, again, not only is the heel stuff bad, like this dude just trying to call moves is terrible. He calls the, the regal roll, the Finley roll, or whatever you want to call it, that uh, that roll from a fireman's carry position. He calls that a rolling senton. He did. Uh, <laughs> just again, it's like those uh, like uh, old time announcers that just make stuff up, but there's none of the charm that, uh, that those guys had. Um, and then also another one of those clearly Vince McMahon fed lines where we have Michael Cole calling Brian Danielson. He's just, he's just like a little pit bull. If you recall, that's what every guy who's like under 230 pounds in the last 20 years, that's the gimmick that uh, Vince wants to give them. It's the same thing they would say about AJ Styles when he first came into WWE. Back inside the ring, Brian crotches Sheamus on the top. We get light dueling chants. And well, the then, dueling chants are Daniel Bryan on one side, and on the other side, essentially the Sheamus fans chanting 18 seconds. We get joint manipulation by Daniel Bryan. Love this. No one in WWE is doing holds like Bryan Danielson is doing here. No, and it's it's interesting because like the crowd is with it when he's doing the other stuff, but they have no idea what to make of this stuff. And Michael Cole, Jerry Lawler, and Booker T are not the commentary team to be calling these sorts of maybe the Jerry Lawler from 1983 mid South appearing with, uh, with, with Jim, Jim Ross, Ross that we reviewed uh, not all that long ago, maybe that Jerry Lawler, but here uh, these guys don't really, uh, don't really have a clue. 
On the top rope, a Frankensteiner is blocked, and Sheamus hits a shoulder block off the top rope for a two count. In the ring, Sheamus goes shoulder first into the post. He goes, he tumbles outside where where Brian posts him a couple more times. In the ring, Brian's laying in big kicks to the shoulder of Sheamus, and he's kicking him, and he's kicking him in the ropes, and the ref DQs Daniel Bryan for kicking too much ass. Your winner of the first fall is Sheamus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have that uh, that note as well. He gets disqualified for kicking too much ass. Um, this also reminded me of was it the uh, the two out of three falls Brian Danielson Sammy Guevara match uh, in AEW where they did a somewhat similar finish in the I believe it was the first fall where Guevara got disqualified in the first fall on purpose to inflict more damage uh, to then quickly win the second fall. So it looks like that may be what we're doing here. Uh, we also yeah, had no rest lo- period. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've got the rest period. I loved also the, the uh, Katsuhiko Nakajima style kick in the corner by Brian Danielson, where he's got, uh, uh, he's got Seamus face first in the corner. And then just with all his might kicks the rope, into uh, Sheamus' face. Such a great heel move, uh, even though Danielson's being cheered here. Yeah, so no rest period. We go pretty much right into the second fall and a running drop kick to the corner. He immediately puts Sheamus into the LaBelle lock. Uh, it's called the Yes lock at this point. And Sheamus won't tap, but he passes out, and Daniel Bryan gets the second fall pretty quickly here. So his strategy works. We should know that after the first fall, like this was his plan. Like he's smiling. He's happy. He doesn't mind at all that he got disqualified. Uh, and then after this, after uh, after Danielson, as he said, gets the second fall very quickly with the yes lock. We see Doc Samson from AEW. I had no idea that Doc Samson with much more hair was the the uh, the TV doctor slash real doctor in WWE. I had no idea. He sure was. Doc Sampson is called into the ring to check on Sheamus. We get dueling yes and no chance. And then the fall starts and Sheamus catches Brian running in with the broke kick. The same move he defeated him with at WrestleMania. He crawls over and Brian kicks out. Brian throws some big kicks. Sheamus fights back. But a kick to the head and Sheamus is down. Another two count only. Brian goes to the top. He gets cut off. Brian knocks Sheamus off the top using his headbutts. Then he tries a diving headbutt that misses. Both men are down at this point. At this point, then uh, uh, Danielson misses the running drop kick in the corner. Sheamus is making a comeback with Polish hammers, uh, which uh, are double axles or whatever you want to call it. That's amusing to me in the midst of all this greatness from Brian Danielson. As he fights back. He nails Brian in the face with the brogue kick. And this time he gets the pin, still champion, Sheamus, and the majority of the Chicago crowd is uh, is is shaking their head just like we were as we yes. watched this and said, "What? How? How are they not going with with Brian Danielson here?" It's the height of stubbornness. It's the most WWE WWE had ever been uh, in terms of their booking and having a guy who wasn't over as a top guy but had everything that wwe liked out of top guys then you had a guy in brian danielson who was over as a top guy and had this organic groundswell but he didn't fit their mold and so they weren't going to go with it the finish was lame the match was awesome this was was brian danielson as rick flair with uh with sheamus playing the part of lex luger uh, or Sting, or you know, Road their Warrior form- Hawk, Road Warrior One Hawk the in their guys. formative yeah. years. This was Brian Danielson taking a guy who was passable and making him look like a world beater, uh, even if the crowd didn't buy it. Uh, in terms of wanting him to win, uh, Danielson made Sheamus look so much better than he was at this point. No, and and you know the Chicago crowd here in WWE Chicago crowd in 2012 with a lot of dueling chants. Uh, that was not every city you went to that was not a lot of the big uh, matches there so well and you also have to keep in mind this is again this is pre aw this is pre any real relevant competition this is pre like the new japan boom in the u.s to an extent um so this is like you had 
people who a lot of people there who probably didn't didn't necessarily love WWE, but WWE was what was available, and so they went and they loved guys like Brian Danielson and CM Punk, um, and they weren't getting what they wanted. We've got two geeks in the ring from St. Louis. It's Aaron Relic and Jay Hatton, who was known as Heath Hatton on the Indies. Uh, they cut a promo. Uh, this is crazy that these two jobbers are cutting a promo. <laughs> they keep saying two is greater than one over and over again. And this leads to a handicap match. These two geeks taking on Ryback. Ryback comes out, gets the Goldberg chance as he destroys both guys quickly. It's really, it's pretty incredible that we're like 11 years removed from Goldberg's you know, the end of his WCW run, we had his, you know, his WWF run, uh, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point if it comes up on a podcast that we do. Uh, so we're probably what eight years removed from that, and still the second oh, that a, yeah. uh, second that a big guy, uh, you know, comes out and is, a, a, you know, he's a killer, he's squashing guys. People still immediately chant Goldberg, um, and it's you know, you can like Goldberg, you cannot like Goldberg, but Ryback. He's no Goldberg when it comes to being Goldberg. This feels forced. Um, it's it's fine, but it's not great. The thing I'm most amused by in this match is how the smaller of the two, I think it's Aaron Relic, his kick pad is both longer and wider than his own torso. Uh, it's uh, it's But it's bizarre, absolutely bizarre to hear jobbers get mic time in ring on a pay-per-view. This was weird. It, they do get there with Ryback. Ryback does get over and does get so big that he drew a big pay-per-view number going Punk, for the right? title undefeated against CM Punk. Yeah, it's and that was the uh the debut of the Shield. Uh John Moxley, uh, uh Dean Ambrose at the time with uh, Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins, they made their their debut in that match as well. So uh they do get there, but here this is the beginning of that Ryback push. Speaking of CM Punk, the WWE champion is CM Punk at this point, and he's in the back with Matt Stryker. He cuts a promo about the match that's about to happen here. This is for the WWE Championship. It's a Chicago street fight. The champion CM Punk defending against the challenger, Chris Jericho, and we get a video recap that does a great job catching us up on this feud. Yeah, it's tremendous. It's uh, As you said, it's a Chicago street fight. The whole deal was... Chris Jericho basically saying that CM Punk comes from a family of addicts. He's destined to be an addict. He's destined to become an alcoholic. He uh, he hits him with a bottle. He pours alcohol over and they do a, a really wacky segment where Jericho makes Punk take a field sobriety test in the ring because he's so convinced that Punk is, in fact, an alcoholic. He's drunk. And if he fails the field sobriety test, uh, that means he, meaning Punk, will have to forfeit the world title or forfeit the WWE championship. Uh, Punk acts like he is drunk to start, and Jericho's all happy, and then Punk aces the rest of the field sobriety test, takes down Jericho, uh, and that leads us to, like you said, the match itself. I have no recollection of this feud whatsoever, but this video package was great, and I'm excited to see uh, really peak Punk and peak Jericho go at it here. A great ovation for CM Punk in, as, you know, he's, when he comes out in Chicago every time, it's great, but it's it's nowhere near the level of the Money in the Bank show we talked about uh, a year prior. Uh, it's nowhere near his return to AEW Rampage, uh, but this was, this was not that, but it was still uh, one of the biggest ovations up to this point from this crowd. Oh, yeah. It still is a massive pop. And me sitting here in my chair, I uh, it was a massive pop for me because CM Punk comes out. And again, this is a guy who understands his wrestling history. He knows how to do a street fight. He is wearing jeans. He has boots. And he has knee pads over his jeans. That is how you do a street fight. You don't come out your gear. Uh, Jericho also out in jeans with knee pads. You come out in a street fight gear, damn it. We have both of them here. I love it. Both of them here understand history. They both have knee pads over their jeans. Tremendous, yes. tremendous fashion corner here from uh, from both men. And uh, we Punk is wearing also in the fashion corner. He's got a, uh, a, a Misfits shirt on that yes. says drug-free on it. Uh, tremendous. 
they show his family at ringside. And uh, uh, fun fact, sitting there uh, with his family uh, is uh, who he calls like his adoptive uh, uh, mother and sister, who uh, he uh, uh, he grew up with when his family uh, w- wasn't there for him. And uh, uh, and one of the his sister name is Chez sitting at ringside there and uh, you can see her also in the CM Punk documentary uh, on the WWE Network or Peacock uh, where she talks about their their childhood and growing up and everything fun fact uh, she was my first girlfriend in sixth grade <laughs> so uh, really wow. yes so I, 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 I that... saw her at, saw her sitting at ringside and I'm like oh there's Chez yeah she was my my first girlfriend when I was in sixth grade I knew that uh, if I'm not mistaken didn't didn't uh <laughs> Isn't there also a wrestling connection with like was it Punk or was it Armando Estrada? Somebody worked with your wife or something. Both, both yeah, both. Worked with their wife at the mall <laughs> at Orland Park, Orland Square Mall, right? Orland Square Mall. Yeah, my wife worked at uh, the Wild Pair Shoe Store with C- with uh, CM Punk uh, with Phil Brooks at the time, and then uh, she also worked at uh, a clothing store Jay Riggins with uh, Armando Alejandro Estrada uh, later. So Amazing. yeah, small small world here in the uh, Chicago uh, Chicago scene. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we get loud CM Punk chance to start this match. Punk starts with a beatdown of Jericho. Punk hits Jericho with a kendo stick. Loud ECW chant after the kendo stick is used. I love that. Some, you know, even after the reboot of ECW, uh, we've <laughs> reviewed a late stage WWE ECW show, which bore no resemblance to even. The early part of WWE ECW, much less the actual Extreme Championship Wrestling. Even then, a Singapore Kane shot draws uh, an ECW chant here in 2012. Start of this match is great. How often do we talk about this pod? Uh, talk on this podcast about blood feuds and how frustrating it is when you have uh, everything leading to the big culmination, the street fight, the cage match, whatever, and then the match starts with. Arm up. drags and side yeah. headlock takeovers <laughs> and wrestling. We're, we're here now after all this personal animosity is going to be settled with who is the better professional wrestler. That is not on CM Punk's mind at all. He is out for blood. He is punching. He is kicking. He is throwing elbows. None of them look clean, and that's the point. Uh, he knocks Jericho to the floor. I love the way this started. Yeah, tremendous uh, intensity. This was the right way to start a fight. And Jericho gets the advantage with an eye poke, which is great. Jericho then hits Punk with the stick. They fight outside the ring. Back inside, Jericho exposes the top turnbuckle, removing the pad. Punk misses a knee to the corner, goes up and over the top, tumbles out to the floor. Jericho is in incredible shape here. This is maybe the best I've seen Chris Jericho look physically. It also still, it throws me for a loop again because I really wasn't watching WWE during this time period. Whenever we get shows from this era of the, I call it the short hair Bon Jovi look, uh, it always throws me off. It's just not ready for that. Jericho rams Punk into the barricade right in front of his family. Punk's sister slaps Jericho. He goes after her and Punk cuts him off just leaping onto Jericho, throwing crazy punches. Punk goes for a pile driver on the floor, but Jericho counters it with a backdrop. Punk is so great here. Everything you just described uh, with uh, Jericho going after his sister, Punk wildly jumping on his back, and then Punk just... Th- this sequence is the closest I've ever seen CM Punk to reaching Terry Funk level. He's pulling the covers off the announce tables. He's throwing stuff around. He's hitting stuff. He's just a wild man. It's perfect. He's got so much anger, so much frustration. He can't. He's trying. He can't channel it. Uh, it's just going everywhere. He's taking it out on the announce tables. He's taking it out on everything, and he's trying to take it out on Jericho. And Jericho keeps uh, shortcutting his way to uh, to safety every time. Here, it's very non WWE style intensity and expression of hatred. Um, it, it's it's really cool to see. He hits him with a monitor, pieces of the announce table, and back inside. Punk fights back, goes for a springboard something, but he slipped. And as he slips coming off the top, Jericho perfectly timed, nails him with the kendo stick, and then beats him down with the stick some more. This was awesome. This could have been disastrous, but these are two pros making it look 
exactly the struggle that you want to see in a fight. Yeah, a hundred percent. Punk, you went for a springboard, probably the springboard clothesline that he does. Again, Punk, great pro wrestler, but not the uh, the most natural or best athlete you'll ever see. So things these things would happen from time to time. But Jericho, the pros pro, like immediately, like you said, all in one motion, those kendo stick shots. It's the type of thing where if you aren't a, a real hardcore fan, if you're not watching super closely, you would just think every part of that was planned. It wasn't, but it was just uh, how good a pros, like you said, both of them are. Yeah, even the announcers could easily say, oh, the stumble cost him, and yes. Jericho countered uh, and was able to hit the stick with the stick immediately. Works perfectly. Uh, so Jericho gets a can of beer and pours it onto Punk. Jericho goes to get another can of beer, but Punk fights back, hits the knee to the corner, followed with the bulldog, hits a low blow with the kendo, with the kendo stick, and then they start countering each other's finisher attempts. Punk goes to the top, and Jericho crotches him. They fight on the top rope, and Punk knocks Jericho off. Knocks and- him off with the Mongolian chop. I love not only is the Anaconda <laughs> Vice the tribute to Tenzan, but the Mongolian chop as well. Or maybe he was a Killer Khan fan, but I'm pretty sure it's Tenzan. Punk comes off the top, hits the flying elbow in tribute to Randy Savage, gets a two count, and the Chicago crowd gets into a Randy Savage chant. Yeah, the Randy Savage chant that is not acknowledged by the announcer. No, at not at all. this time. You, with Vince McMahon in your ear, you do not want to reference Randy Savage. Jericho counters the go to sleep into a bulldog, goes for the lion salt. That gets countered into the GTS, but it's blocked again. Jericho then sends Punk into the chair that was wedged in the corner that I had forgotten about. Yeah, and, I uh, love he- those sorts of spots where you set up, a, you know, whether it be a chair in the corner or... A lot of times, you know, the table on the floor that gets set up in the first few minutes, 15 minutes go by, and then, oh, my God, he gets thrown into it. This is great. He gets a two count out of that, a code breaker by Jericho, and then he puts on the walls of Jericho in the middle. He puts it on Lion Tamer style, then turns it full Boston into the walls of Jericho. That annoyed me only because, I guess, in, in WWE canon, it's the the full Boston version, the walls of Jericho, that's the finisher. But when you're watching it, the Lion Tamer version so much is cooler. so much more painful looking <laughs> than the regular Boston Crab, but it is what it is. Punk gets to the ropes, but it doesn't matter. This is a street fight. So he keeps reaching and keeps reaching until he's under the ring and he grabs a fire extinguisher and he shoots it at Jericho's face from the bottom of the walls of Jericho position. This was uh, this was creative. It was creative. It worked. I feel like we've seen spots like this in recent years where... Uh, you know, the, the fire extinguisher is grabbed. It doesn't go off and you have to improvise. I always worry for that, but they pulled it off really well. Um, and yeah, the, the whole sequence where Punk is crawling and he's reaching for the ropes and the announcers are selling it like if he gets to the ropes, it's going to be a break. And then he gets to the ropes and they realize, oh, wait, this is extreme rules. That's not a rope break. And Punk keeps crawling, like you said, to get the fire extinguisher. Very clever. Also clever was uh, Jericho's selling of this fire extinguisher to the face. He has he he on his knees. He crawls over to the referee yes. to wipe his eyes in the referee's shirt to uh, to to get the uh, the extinguisher out of his eyes. This is great. Lots of the uh, the little things which you and I both love and talk about on this podcast. Uh, Jericho and Punk are tremendous in this match that way. Jericho gets knocked outside. He's on. He's put on the announce table. Punk ends up coming off the top rope, hitting the elbow, putting them both through the Spanish announce table on the floor. This, this is the biggest move of the show. Super impressive, particularly given that that was a long, long distance from the top rope to uh, to where the announce table is. And again, Punk, like he's not the best athlete. This isn't AJ Styles or Will Ospreay doing this. I had questions whether he would make it, but he did. It looked great. Looks tremendous. Uh, Punk comes. uh, So back inside, Punk covers him, gets a two count. He then transitions from the kick out into the Anaconda Vice, trying for the submission. But Jericho, with his free hand, gets the stick, hits Punk in the head with it. He then hits a code breaker while Punk was holding a chair. So the chair went into his face, gets a two count as well. Jericho goes for the go to sleep. He's going to use Punk's own move on him, but that's blocked. Punk slingshots Jericho into the exposed buckle from earlier in the match. 
He hits the go to sleep, and CM Punk wins, still WWE champion, celebrates with his family at ringside. Awesome, tremendous match. Tremendous match. Awesome finishing sequence. Uh, just just really spot on throughout. Like we said, it felt like a fight. It felt like two guys who hated each other. They had a brawl. There was also creative spots, but it never felt never felt too cute for uh for the hatred that was there the post match is great we get replays of all the crazy spots in the finish uh it's one thing wwe always does a a tremendous job of is letting the big moments sink in not running away from them too quickly to another segment we see punk celebrating Uh, he does a stage dive into where the crowd is thankfully didn't break his foot on this one we go to a uh a don't try this at home uh, video package like they would always show back then. And then we come back and we see still the end of CM Punk celebrating. We go to the broadcast table. Uh, they're talking about what's coming up, but then they flash to the entranceway and we still see CM Punk celebrating with his music on. That's how you make something look and feel important, not by going away from it immediately to something in the back uh, and having everything feel like a self-contained thing. Uh, just tremendous, tremendous pro wrestling for everyone involved here. I love that they license cult of personality for the the streaming replays of this. Yes. So uh, we don't have bad overdub music. We actually have uh, Living Colors cult of personality. Yeah, not his yeah. super lame uh, WWE yes. music that he had before. It's yeah, that's a really good point. I I'm kind of surprised, um, but yeah, no, this is great. Again, like what else could you want? This was two great wrestlers at the height of their powers having a street fight that felt like a street fight and had a really satisfying finish. So we, we've had a WWE pay-per-view that had an awesome Brian Danielson match followed by an awesome CM Punk match. This is a great show so far. Yeah, we're I, not done. That was not the main event. No. Uh, anyone who listens to this podcast knows I am not by nature a WWE guy. I try my best to be uh, to have as little of my bias show through on these shows as possible. But it takes a lot for me to be firmly thumbs up on a wwe show just because the presentation just always kills me and and takes so much out of it from me but man great show so far like the the stuff that didn't matter has been short for the most part outside of the opener but the crowd carried it and those two matches the danielson match and the punk match have been off the charts great and we still have brock lesnar versus john cena to go backstage beth phoenix is not medically cleared for her title match Nikki Bella's opponent's going to be a surprise. So we go to the ring for the WWE Divas Championship. It's the champion Nikki Bella, and her opponent is the surprise returning Layla, former uh, Diva Search winner. Yes, the, and, the uh, lay half of Lay Cool, in case you're That wondering. is correct. Layla wins with a neckbreaker. She's the new Divas champion. Uh, apparently the Bella Twins contract expires the next day, so they oh, wow. opted not to sign a new deal, so they uh, took the title off of them here. Yeah, unfortunately, this is pretty much a nothing match where it works kind of in between the era of really embarrassing present, really embarrassing and objectionable presentation of women and women's title matches in WWE. We're in between that era and the era of really good wrestlers having really good matches in a women's division. We're kind of in that in between where. It's really not much happening. It's not all that entertaining. John Laurinaitis in the back. He says he's going to be on Raw, and we'll tell everybody what Triple H had to say then. And we go to the main event. Brock Lesnar, the returning Brock Lesnar, taking on John Cena. Brock comes out first, and he's in his full MMA gear, not his old WWE gear. This was... Uh, a surprise when you see that uh, you're expecting a returning Brock Lesnar, the wrestler. You're getting Brock Lesnar, the MMA fighter. You're getting UFC Brock Lesnar, including Jimmy John's sponsorship on his shorts. This was absolutely crazy as a wrestling fan to see at the time. Yeah, and again, it was it was great. WWE is usually so terrible at making uh, invasion or outsider angles actually feel that way because everyone's got to conform. Everyone, you know. All the Nexus guys have got to be wearing their Nexus t-shirt at all times, all those sorts of things here. And I assume it's just Brock Lesnar had enough power to get whatever he wanted um, legitimately. And so here, Brock Lesnar, you never see like advertising on the ring or on the uh, ringside area in this era of WWE or in anyone's gear. Here, Brock Lesnar, he's wearing his MMA shorts. He's got Jimmy Johnson. He's got some other random local sponsors from, you know, 
uh, the, the woods where uh, where Brock Lesnar <laughs> lives, basically. Um, and yeah, again, we talked at the open of the show that video package, and then here now, this feels different. It feels dangerous, and it feels decidedly not WWE, which is so welcome. Cena comes out, and even Cena's entrance isn't normal Cena entrance because he's he doesn't know what he's walking into here. Yeah. And he has the doubts swirling in his head already because he's coming off a mania loss to The Rock. And so here is John Cena staring at Lesnar across the ring. Big fight feel. This this is this is this feels different. This is uh and and different is not normal in WWE. And so the Chicago crowd is buzzing. There's an energy here, and the people at home can't wait to see what this is going to be i was one of those people watching on my couch saying wow this is uh this is exciting and the match begins with john cena charging brock lesnar which at the time i guarantee i had the exact same reaction out of my couch when i'm like that is stupid you should not do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah cena rushes lesnar almost like uh it's almost like CM Punk rushing Mickey Gall, maybe. Um, <laughs> but uh, Cena rushes Lesnar. Lesnar takes him down immediately. Uh, just You mentioned the big fight feel. It's one of those things where you didn't need Michael Cole screaming big fight feel for a match that wasn't a big fight because we knew it felt like this. It felt organically big, which is so rare in the WWE. Uh, overly produced, overly sanitized presentation. Um, but yeah, Cena rushes Lesnar. Lesnar immediately stuffs the takedown, takes Cena down, and starts hitting legit nasty as hell elbows from the mount. Hits a huge clothesline, and we see Cena is legit busted open already. He is a mess. We get great replays that show the first elbow connect. The second one is more of like a like a scrape, and then the third elbow. It's like a legit UFC mount elbow knockout shot. John Cena is a man among men for being willing to take this. I remember all the controversy about Randy Orton taking the elbows that bloodied and concussed him and that that was, you know, a, just a planned spot. Uh, and, and, you know, how could they let that happen? I can't imagine that being any, any more violent than what these shots, particularly that third one, looked like. Yeah, the, this was planned to be to cut Cena with elbows yes. and mission accomplished and it was it was brutal Cena then takes Lesnar down which means Lesnar let you take him down yes. uh, <laughs> and so Cena takes Lesnar down he puts on a front face lock and he's got it on for a minute and he has a look on his face like I don't know what to do next <laughs> and it and it was perfect. It was like you know, say what you will about John Cena, but him selling the oh my god, like what what's my next move out of this front face lock? In and you don't have a next move because Lesnar explodes out of it, shows his amateur wrestling skills, reverses it. He's immediately on in the mount and he's throwing punches down. The doctors have to come in and check on John Cena and the. The WWE crowd has not seen a beating like this in this type of style, and the Ever. Chicago crowd is hot for it. No, it's so completely different in every conceivable way from the WWE in-ring style, and then having maybe the most WWE in-ring style wrestler ever, John Cena, on the <laughs> receiving end of it. Uh, makes the whole scene even more surreal. You described a Cena, it's tremendous because, like you said, he it's like from a kayfabe standpoint, his whole goal is I gotta get a hold of Lesnar and I gotta get him down, I gotta get control. And then the second he got that and realized his one goal for the match, he realizes there is nothing I can do from this point, and no. this point <laughs> in and of itself is not getting me close at all to winning this match and surviving. Lesnar dumps Cena outside. Cena's a bloody mess. They're checking on him again. They're talking about super gluing the cut clothes. I feel like I'm watching Born to be Wired ECW and Sabu's <laughs> bicep is being super glued shut. Cena with an elbow, and he goes for the attitude adjustment, his finishing move, and Lesnar immediately counters, hits two German suplexes. Cena knocks Lesnar, who bumps into the referee, and... Lesnar then runs Cena over 
and the ref is dead outside because Lesnar bumped into him and and he's no more. This was a brutal ref bump. Charles Robinson uh, deserved whatever hazard pay he got. He went flying. Lesnar wipes Cena's blood across his own chest. He then goes for a Kimura on Cena's arm. Cena's thrown down and rolls outside. Back inside, Brock wraps Cena's chain around his hand, which will kill John Cena if he gets punched with this. Uh, Instead, he tosses it down. He doesn't need it. Instead, he takes it. He puts it around Cena's ankles. Brock then clotheslines him down again. And then he's got Cena hanging outside the ring by his ankles. So his ankles, the the chain is around the top of the ring post. Cena's hanging Tree of Woe style, but outside the ring, hanging by his ankles as Lesnar just continues to destroy him. Yeah, again, this is... Obviously, WWE fans had seen Brock Lesnar for a long time, but they hadn't seen him in a long time, and they had not seen... This version of Brock Lesnar, I mean, he is he is an animal here. Like, he is just tearing Cena to shreds. Um, and while Cena was an underdog, I mean, that was sort of Cena's role in a lot of matches. You had never seen to this point John Cena beaten down to this level, this completely and this severely. Cena fights back, but Brock throws Cena into the steps. Brock then throws the referee into the ring. He picks this man up, a, a, a human being. A man-sized human being gets picked up by his belt with one hand and thrown into the ring. This was incredible. He picks Charles Robinson up like (laughs) you would pick up your child's toy off the ground. Like it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's wild to see. It was, and it was shot perfectly from a low angle. So you were just like, wow, that was impressive. And so uh, you've got, uh, you. You've got Lesnar going for the F5. He hits it. But at the same time, it knocks the ref down again. He's got a visual pin for a long time. The new ref slides in, but Cena kicks out at two. Lesnar kills this new referee. Immediately. The ref counts to Lesnar gets up. The ref gets up, and Lesnar just clotheslines the hell out of this referee. And this is where the announcers tell us that because of the pull, that Brock Lesnar had in negotiating his contract with John Laurinaitis. Brock Lesnar is allowed to beat up anybody he wants. He can kill announcers. He can beat up referees. He can beat up anyone backstage. He cannot be fined or suspended for any of his actions. Not just during this night at Extreme Rules, but in his contract as a whole, which I find believable (laughs) that, like, if you're sitting down and trying to sign Brock Lesnar to a contract, if he offers that, or if he says that's the only way he's coming in, and he looks at you, you're going to be like, yeah, okay, you can do that. The the ring stairs have come apart into two pieces. He's got the base of those stairs in the ring. Brock with a Kimura on Cena. He won't tap. Cena powers out and picks up Brock and slams him onto the steps to break the hold. Cena then goes, he's on the apron. Brock gets a running start. He jumps off the steps and he jumps so high that his hip hits John Cena's face and Brock tumbles over the top rope in terrifying fashion, hits the floor holding his knee and I, I, at the time, I, I was like, oh, God, it's over. Like, that man just blew out his knee. Whatever was planned is done. And uh, this is the end of Brock Lesnar's career. Like, yeah. it was so scary. I had, up until uh, the randomizer pulled this for this, uh, for this podcast, I had never seen this show in full. I had never seen this match in full. But I had seen that spot before. I forgot about it. And then it happened. And I screamed. Like you said, you would think that, this would be the end of Brock Lesnar. Instead, he pops up. He's limping slightly, but he's really more just laughing and smiling at just the insanity of that. And he's Brock Lesnar, so he's okay. So he's in the ring. Cena climbs to the apron. Lesnar goes to do it one more time. But Cena this time hits him in the head with his chain. We had a great establishing camera shot right before this when Cena was on the floor Lesnar was limping around on the floor, getting back. And just for a couple seconds, they cut to Cena as Cena's wrapping his fist in the chain. The announcers don't even notice it. They don't say it, but it plants in your head that, okay, maybe Cena has a chance. And then what you described is what occurs. 
Yeah, the crowd goes crazy for this. Lesnar's busted open now from that chain shot. And Lesnar, he's doing a Barry Windham, glassy-eyed, dazed look. He's on the Mount Rushmore of Uh, guys that can do that. Unreal. What Brock Lesnar does not get enough credit for, actually very similarly to Vader, we talked about this in a recent episode on the bonus feed, for a big man, a dominant big man, a terrifying big man who most of the time is on offense and is killing his opponent, when the time comes to sell, he is such an effective big man seller at Hall getting over. Yeah, getting over when the when the guy finally has been able to hurt him a little bit. He's unreal, unreal at doing that. Like you said, this is Barry Windham level glassy eyed selling. Cena hits the attitude adjustment onto the steps, and the ref counts three. John Cena wins in Brock Lesnar's return. It, I, I was. Shocked. I remember at the time the controversy around, holy crap, you beat Lesnar his first match in. Uh, Dave Meltzer, Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Uh, I had to go back and and, and reread some of uh, that coverage at the time. Dave says, the match was absolutely perfect until the finish. In making Lesnar into something special and different, Cena versus Lesnar had a level of suspension of disbelief that no WWE match has had in years. Not even Cena versus Punk match came this close. And it was all about the finish. It was it, Everybody was like, this was a great match. And then the finish was uh, uh, up, just a, a whole th- thing of controversy. Uh, well, the finish is, that is the finish you do when they have their rematch at WrestleMania the following year, that's not the finish you do his first match in. I didn't watch the match live, but I vividly remember following on the Wrestling Observer board and everyone having that reaction. Like, what the hell just happened? When he was given the finish, Lesnar was told that he was going to be protected because he was going to destroy Cena and that Cena would get the win, collapse, and then have to be helped out of the ring and left for dead. But instead, Cena ends up doing a weird promo. Very weird. Again, I cannot find any corollary for this on any WWE show ever. This We talk about non-WWE feeling things. The end of this show is the strangest ending of a WWE show I have ever watched. So Cena does a weird promo that, based on what the Wrestling Observer was told, was not authorized for him to do. Everyone backstage, including Vince McMahon, either had no idea what he was doing, and it was not in the script for the show, or maybe Vince knew and he was pretending he didn't know, but given how it turned out, uh, the speculation is the former. In the interview, Cena talks about how much he gave for the match, and he did, and and how he was going to go on vacation for a while. Talked about how everyone in WWE, good guys, bad guys, big guys, and small guys, do everything they can to entertain you people. He said he was proud that he had that he could have a match like this in Chicago. He calls Chicago and, a wrestling town, a word you don't ever hear used, a phrase you never hear used on yeah, WWE podcasts. And if he's leaving for a while... He wouldn't want to have gone out any other way and in any other city. He tells the people to get home safe. Uh, My notes just say, this is an alternate reality WWE promo for sure. This felt like the type of thing you would hear and see on a show after the cameras went off the air. Uh, You know, an earnest, almost kind of breaking the fourth wall type of thing. Not something that would be on it, particularly with what you described completely different than what Lesnar was told was going to happen uh, to get him to agree to the finish. So how long do you think Cena was out? How long do you think this vacation uh, lasted for Cena? How if long I remember was he gone? Right After he, this promo, how long was he gone? If I remember correctly, because I remember there being a big uproar about that as well, it was like the next week he was back. Oh no, Cena was back the next day on, on Monday, TV. On Raw. On Raw and announced as being in the main event of the next pay-per-view. <laughs> So, wow. <laughs> so yeah, the the For debate. For anyone who says, "Well, Cena's not a carny," you gotta you gotta watch the end of the show, I guess. 
So the debate of uh, should Cena have been the first one to defeat Brock Lesnar because the build and the anticipation is the real money and the capture is the end of the story. And the segue to start the new story, uh, should Cena versus Lesnar have been SummerSlam if it was if it was going to be the first loss for Lesnar? Shouldn't that be later, like in a SummerSlam period? Uh, should Lesnar have won the first, setting up Cena getting a win in a year from now? Yes. All, <laughs> all, the, all the valid questions. Um, the next show that Lesnar headlines would be SummerSlam. Didn't he lose to Triple H? Against Triple H, based on an angle shot the next day on Raw, where Lesnar used the Kimura and, uh, to break the arm of Triple H in storyline. So, and Triple H beat him at SummerSlam, correct? I be, uh, I don't remember the finish. Uh, maybe what, you can. What year uh, is that? Is it SummerSlam? So that would have been 2012. I am almost yeah. sure. Take that a look he at SummerSlam because 2012. Because I remember. All right, SummerSlam 2012. Pulling it up here live yeah. on air. Uh, live. Uh, last, air. While you do that, I'll leave you with one note from uh, the last note from the Observer. Uh, Dave says very well, different from just about any great match in WWE history. It was more like Ogawa versus Hashimoto yes. wars in Japan, only this was more professional. <laughs> yes, that is the perfect, perfect description of it. Um, apparently, no, I, I was wrong, um, and Triple H did get defeated by John, okay. or by uh, by Brock Lesnar at that point. But yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know that there's any real booking argument that you bring Brock Lesnar back, and regardless of who it's against, he loses in his first match, much less against John Cena, in basically the exact match they should have had in the rematch after yes. Brock Lesnar killed him here. This show did 251,000 worldwide buys. That's up 39,000 buys domestically from the year prior. Wow. So big draw for, uh, uh, for Brock Lesnar's return. This was a hugely successful show. Hugely enjoyable show. This was, uh, I you know, anytime the randomizer picks a three-hour pay-per-view, uh, <laughs> I'm always like, okay, here we go. I gotta, I gotta carve some time out. This, the time flew by. We talked about all those great matches. This was a tremendous show. If you haven't seen it, go out of your way. This is a uh, a very legendary show. Yeah, it's awesome. It's one of, honestly for me, it's one of the more enjoyable WWE slash WWF pay per views I've ever watched. I can't remember. I mean, the finish aside from the main event, I can't remember too many WWE shows. Uh, and I'm not talking NXT takeovers because those were on a different level, but WWE main roster shows that weren't a WrestleMania uh, that had three matches on it, the level of Danielson, Sheamus, CM Punk, Chris Jericho and Brock Lesnar and John Cena. Those are three great matches that would be the best match on most pay-per-views. And here we had them on the same match on Extreme Rules of all shows. Uh, favorite thing on this show for you? Oh, man, that's tough. If the finish was different, if it was the right finish, Brock <laughs> yep. Lesnar and John Cena would be perfect by match. far my favorite thing on the show because it was so different. Everything was perfect about it up until that point. Everything's exactly what it should have been. But that finish ruined it. To me, it's Cena Jericho, or excuse me, it's Punk Jericho because they did everything you would want them to do in a street fight. They did it the right way. Satisfying finish. Um, yeah, I guess it, it still is a very WWE show because you had three great matches, two of which the finishes were objectionably bad <laughs> and the wrong decision. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so you're you uh, we're we're spot on together with our our favorite things, and I think we're spot on with our uh, least favorite things on this show. Uh, the finishes uh, for me were were some of my least favorite things on this show, and uh, honorable mention to that hideous table spot uh, to to end the, uh, the the table match. Yeah, the show. How about uh, you? The show Cody match. Yeah, I mean, I I guess really in the grand scheme of things, it's not a big deal, but. Dolph Ziggler looked so good for those few minutes he was in, and he was just there to make this complete lump of nothingness, Brodus Clay, look good in his first pay-per-view win. So that was just kind of kind of depressing to watch. But yeah, on the whole, awesome show. Awesome show. And uh, if you want to know what shows we're going to be reviewing next week in the free feed, this week in the bonus feed, uh, you can do that by following us on all of the social media platforms at Russell at Random. We'll put up a GIF, 
tell you what we're going to review. And if uh, we told you uh, already, if you want to be a patron, you want to get all that bonus content, you can go to patreon.com slash wrestling at random. Uh, facebook.com slash wrestling random these are all ways to interact with the show we'd love to hear if you have thoughts uh, if you remember the lesnar finish and you had a thought about it at that time share it with us we want to hear from you uh, uh so you can uh hit us up on all of the social media platforms uh, dms are always open as well so uh, uh go ahead and do that and with that we're going to wrap it up we're going to call it a podcast adam thank you for joining us Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Randomizer. I didn't think I would be saying that with a three-hour WWE pay-per-view from 2012, uh, but this over-delivered as much as anything could. Thanks again, everyone, for listening, and we'll talk to you again next time.